This is EDUC 4703U, Teaching and Learning, Problem-Based Learning. This is session four, video clip two, and the title of this video clip is Theory and Structure of PBLOs, part two. The analysis questions for this video clip are as follows. What role does a case study play when included in a PBLO? Number two, what qualities does the use of video and other multimedia techniques add to case studies. Number three, how can reflection and introspection be fostered when using case studies? Number four, what role does authenticity play in the development of multimedia case studies? The role of case studies. Recently, case studies have been used in business and legal schools as an effective teaching tool and they have also begun to appear in math, science, and technology education programs. The use of case studies in these programs has been varied and includes, one, studies that focus on identifying learning outcomes such as higher order reasoning, reflective thinking, decision making, strategic inquiry, and collaboration. Two, studies that examine variables influencing the success rate of case-based professional development activities such as the role of discussion and collaboration. And three, studies that report on the construction and implementation of new technologies that support case-based learning. This is taken from you, Pedretti, Benz, Hewitt, Perez, and Van Oostveen, 2002. Typically, these case studies are text-based. Although there is an increasing interest in the use of multimedia or video-based cases in the literature, case studies can be described as complex examples which give an insight into the context of a problem as well as illustrating the main point or alternatively as student-centered activities based on activities that uh, demonstrate theoretical concepts in an applied setting. And that's a reference by uh, Davis and Wilcock, 2003. Then taking a closer look at multimedia case studies, some comments about multimedia cases uh, use in case studies primarily taken from Benz et al. 2009 and Hewitt et al. 2003 are listed in the theory part of this presentation. However, some of them are things such as the interactive multimedia case studies, that is studies which allow for reflection and discussion following the viewing of the case, appear to be successful in terms of fostering introspective analysis and discourse about teaching practice. Secondly, interactive case, multimedia case studies shift the focus of the learner attention away from the performance of the on-screen teacher to thinking about their own performance. Thirdly, interactive cases focus most of the learner's attention on their own reactions to situations. Fourthly, viewers of video cases can replace segments at their leisure and analyze interactions, facial expressions, and body language in depth. Again, multimedia case me um, methods, because of their increased flexibility, their capacity and portability are particularly attractive to educators. Multimedia case methods have considerable attraction for educators as they can represent teaching and learning situations, perspectives, and practices as they are found in the field. In addition, case methods can, be, can act as boundary objects, that is, mediating agents for enabling interactions between disparate communities of practice. And finally, case methods, um, in, in an effort to improve the efficacy, the efficiency of multimedia case methods, learners and instructors interacting with them must experience perspectives and practices depicted in them and, in so doing, develop their own representations, reifications of such experiences. Addressing the question of reality video, does it really exist? Multimedia case studies provide a window through which educators can view the real world of teaching and learning in schools. They have, however, may have fundamental limitations regarding the degree to which they can and should be considered to represent reality in the schools. And although multimedia case studies usually contain important contextual var variables, they can misleadingly present an illusion of fully representing reality. This may be particularly problematic when there is a significant dissociation between the world of experience and a representation of it. In a 1996 
uh, paper, Savory and Duffy, uh, nominated two guiding forces in developing problem-based scenarios. Firstly, that the problems must raise the concepts and principles relevant to the content domain. And secondly, that the problems must be real. They stated there are three reasons why the problems must address real issues. First, because the students are open to explore all dimensions of the problem, there's real difficulty of creating a rich problem within a consistent set of information. Second, real problems tend to engage learners more. There is a larger context of familiarity with the problem. Finally, students want to know the outcome of the problem. What's being done about the flood? Did AT&T buy NCR? What was the problem with the patient? These outcomes are not possible with artificial problems. Is it, it is, is it necessary then, when incorporating authentic learning experiences into learning environments, to design totally real or highly realistic simulations? Is the physical or simulated reality of a learning situation a critical component of effectiveness? And that's all taken from Savory and Duffy, 1996 Problem-Based Learning, an Instructional Model and its Constructivist Framework. There are also arguments to counter um, the need for realism within multimedia case studies. And the following um, are taken from a paper given by Harrington et al., 2003. In that paper, they provide 10 characteristics of authentic activities. These characteristics have been distilled from a review of papers on authentic learning environments from the literature on situated learning, anchored instruction, and problem-based learning, and the characteristics are used to select cases for investigation. A selection of those characteristics is given here. Please refer to the paper for the remainder of the list. So number one, authentic activities have real-world uh, relevance. Activities match as nearly as possible the real-world tasks of professionals in practice rather than decontextualized or classroom-based tasks. Secondly, authentic activities are ill-defined, requiring students to define the tasks and subtasks needed to complete the activity. Thirdly, authentic activities comprise complex tasks to be investigated by students over a sustained period of time. Fourthly, authentic activities provide the opportunity for students to examine the task from different perspectives using a variety of resources. And fifthly, authentic activities provide the opportunity to collaborate. Where are the problems if you're using a multimedia case studies? If the multimedia case studies used are authentic, as defined by the characteristics given on the previous slide, a number of problems may be identified depending upon the perspectives and past experiences of the learners who are interacting with the PBLO. See the example PBLOs posted in WebCT as references. From the, for the theoretical perspectives for this particular video clip, I would ask you to take a look at the four papers that are listed there, Ben Hewitt and Pedretti, 2009, Davis and Wilcock, 2003, Harrington, Oliver, and Reeves, 2003, and finally, Hewitt, Pedretti, Benz, Valencore, and Yoon, 2003. And finally, the synthesis questions for this video clip are as follows. One, a case study is an instance or example of a particular phenomenon. How can the study of a single instance have any benefits regarding the development of generalizations? Number two, why is authenticity and realism important for multimedia case studies? Number three, how can authenticity be built into the multimedia case study part of a PBLO? And number four, why should the problems to be solved in a multimedia case study not be stated explicitly? In other words, the problems are not identified as such within the case study. Mm -hmm.